Well, good morning and welcome to everyone. Um, it's good to see you all here this morning. Um, I am thinking that probably um, Andy is going to try and join us in just a minute. Andy is at Hove this morning um, with the folk there and a few others all being well. So we'll see Andy in just a moment. Just uh, a few words to say where we're going to go with, the, with this worship this morning. So John is reading for me. Um, I'm afraid I left it a bit late to ask anybody else and then remembered last night that I could do with a reader. Um, <laughs> a nod from Dan, obviously a common problem with us ministers. Um, then Dan will be leading our prayers after um, our, bit, our prayers of intercession. And Bob is going to be sharing with us this morning um, on a reflection around hearing God's voice and the prophetic word. So that's what we've got to look forward to this morning. Um, a reminder that this evening there will be an online service. This will be led by Jonathan. It's a prayer and meditation service. There's a Zoom link um, going out. So if you'd like to join that this evening, I'm sure uh, Jonathan would love to see you. And whilst we're thinking about Jonathan, also the fact that next Sunday, the 1st of November, is All Saints Day and we think about the saints before and after and all the rest of them, but also a particular saint. And that's a saint who lives amongst us, works amongst us, and is one of our local preachers, which is Jonathan. Um, so Jonathan is going to be a, a, it's going to be his accreditation service as he completed his uh, local preacher's studies last year, last about this time last year. And we were going to have a spring welcome service as we recognised his move from being on trial on note and then onto full plan. But the plan didn't work because of COVID. So we're going to do that next week, um, have a service where people uh, have his accreditation for being a local preacher on full plan. And hello, Andy, did you want to speak to us? I'll try, but we might get a lot of feedback. Oh, we're getting lots here anyway. Um, but it's good to be with you and uh, just for this part of our service at the beginning. And uh, I'll turn the camera around so people can see who's here and people can wave. Hopefully you can see. There you go. So here we are at Hove uh, and joining with you in worship in the circuit. And we uh, will just have a short prayer for us both as we lead into our worship. So let's pray. And so as we join together in worship, some online, some in this building, we just pray that during our worship, we will hear your word to us again, eternal God, that we might find that living spirit within us that would guide us in our daily living. For this we ask in the name of Christ. Amen. And so we hope you have a good service and uh, we'll catch up later, I'm sure. So uh, yeah. goodbye for now. And blessings to all of you at home. Thank bye you. for now. So as Hove go and have their first hymn, we will have our first hymn, which is number 407 in Singing the Faith. It's Hear the Call of the Kingdom. Brilliant. Well done. Um, come now just to a, a little thought about this morning. So I sent out around um, a sheet. There you go. It's it's a sheet of houses and uh, it's, it's a little bit like living on my street. So I was just thinking about um, that in a moment. So first of all, before we come to that, we're going to have our prayers for this morning. So let us pray. Life-giving God, the book of Genesis poetically recalls how in the beginning your spirit hovered over the waters of the deep and brought life to the universe and filled it with all kinds of living things. We thank you that you made yourself known to human beings, encouraging them to have a relationship with you. We thank you for those who listened and followed your call. People such as Abraham and Sarah, Moses, Aaron and Miriam. We remember your prophets who spoke about truth and justice, prophets such as Isaiah, Jeremiah and Amos. 
We thank you for Jesus, priest, prophet and king, who spoke about you in a new and powerful way. Not only did he speak challenging words, he offered transformative teaching and life enhancing deeds and actions. He was the embodiment of love in action, enabling others to hear your words of love. Through our act of worship today, help us by the power of that spirit to hear your word for us, challenging our preconceptions, rattling our cages, shaking us out of our complacency and filling us with words and deeds of love, giving us the courage to speak out against injustice. Help us also to recognise our part in maintaining the status quo, challenging us so that we too can be changed and be change makers in your name. Amen. So when Jesus spoke to the people, he asked them to do two really important things. The first was to love God and the second was to love our neighbours. And when we do these two things, we can bring joy and love, not just into our lives, but the lives of other people too. So that picture I showed you at the beginning, this is the one that's been sent out this morning. So I want to tell you a little bit about the picture. In this street, there are three different types of housing. Um, and you might find them on any street. The first house is a little bit like the one I live in now, but the front door is different. It's got a sunshine window in it. Now, my granddad was a carpenter and he used to, to make these sunshine doors and he loved them because he thought they were just gorgeous, bright and cheerful, especially when people painted them yellow. All of those sunshine doors, as far as he was concerned, should be painted yellow. So as a child, I grew up in Newquay and there were a number of these doors across the town that Grandad had made. Um, they weren't all painted yellow, unfortunately, but it made him happy. And he hoped that that sunshine door would make other people happy too. The next house is what we call a dormer bungalow. And when my children were very small, we lived in a bungalow. That is a house without any stairs. All our rooms were on one level. And we thought it might be a good idea to put a room in the roof but we moved instead. And the final building is a tower block. And I have friends who live in a building like this. Their neighbours all live in the same building. It's a bit like a vertical street rather than a horizontal one. Now, since March, we have begun to get to know our neighbours differently, especially when every single Thursday evening, we went outside to clap and make a noise to support all the people who worked in essential jobs thinking about those who worked in the NHS, the shops, the police, the ambulance, fire service. And it was lovely to get to see the people and learn their names. But sadly, we hadn't done that with all of our neighbours up to then. So this morning, I'd like you to colour in a picture, which it might be that one, or maybe you'd like to draw a picture of the houses in your street and remember who lived in them. Maybe even draw a picture of their pets if they have any. Our neighbours have a lovely great big black and white border collie called Murphy, but my drawing doesn't go as far as drawing dogs. I can just about manage houses. Ah, Dan's cat. There you are. If you haven't got a pet, you can always draw Dan's cat. So whilst you remember the people in your street, your neighbours, perhaps remember who they are, and that can be part of your prayers for them. We can show love for our neighbours by being kind in different ways. And when we do these things, we can bring joy and love to us and to others, but the lives of the people around about us. So we're going to sing a song now about joy. And it's got, uh, it's the one that sings, um, it's got joy, joy, joy down in my heart. And when the song is ended, then John will read our, our, our Bible readings for us this morning. So I've got that joy, joy, joy down in my heart. The reading this morning is uh, Deuteronomy 34, verses 1 to 12. Moses dies and is buried in the land of Moab. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Physica, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land, Gilead 
as far as Dan, all Nephali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the Western Sea, and Negev, and the plain, that is, the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees as far as Zor. The Lord said to him, this is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will have I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab and the Lord's command. He was buried in a valley in the land of Moab opposite Beth Prior but no one knows his burial place to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His sight was impaired, unimpaired and his vigor had not abated. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab for 30 days. Then the period of mourning for Moses was ended. Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him and the Israelites obeyed him, doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and his entire land and for all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. Now we move on to uh, Matthew 22, and it's Matthew 22 verses 34 to 46, entitled here, The Greatest Commandment. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together and one of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. One of these two commandments hang on the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. And Jesus said to them, how is it then that David by spirit calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. Amen. Right. Hopefully we're still on track. We can still hear each other. So um, having heard the readings, we're now going to uh, sing together a, a song. It's number 161 in Singing the Faith and it's Speak, O Lord. And it's lovely now to hear Bob's reflection on um, the readings from this morning, which I think in a sense also includes those words from that hymn. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Billy B. Thank you very much, Deborah. It's good to be here and especially to be linked with my friends in the Hove Church sharing this with us in that uh, this unusual way. So, when I was uh, a teenager, that's uh, long before most of you were born, uh, the old musical stars were still around. <coughs> and uh, I saw many of them at the Empire Theatre in, in Oldham. 
And around that time, a lot of them were getting to the point where they were refining their acts and changing them to go on the radio. Uh, and it was very interesting to, to see them in that respect. And one of them was a chap called Sandy Powell. And uh, when he switched to radio, every time he came on it, he, yeah, he said something which became a cat, his catchphrase. He said, can you hear me, mother? <laughs> Yeah, and uh, his mother could hear him. Even if it was 100 miles away with the wonders of radio, she could hear him. Whether she listened, many a time I expect she said, oh, I've heard all this before and switched it off. But uh, yes, we just sang Speak, O Lord, which implies that the Lord, when he speaks, can be heard and we will be able to hear him. And as we hear him, we'd be able to listen. You see the progression there, which we're used to in our normal conversation with one another. Speech, hearing, listening, and then responding in whatever way. In that reading from Deuteronomy, we're told that Moses heard God speak to him, and as he heard, he attended to what he heard and acted on it. We heard that Moses went up from the lowlands of Moab to Mount Nebo. Maybe he first heard God tell him to do that, and that's why he was up there. And from the top, the Lord showed him the whole of the land from Gilead to Dan and all Judah as far as the Western Sea. So he's looking westward across the whole of Israel, the land that he had for 40 years long to enter. And then we read this. And the Lord said to him, this land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that I would give to their descendants, I will let you see with your own eyes, but you will not cross over into it. That must have been a shock. But it's true, as we read on. The implication was that he would soon die, and so he did. Now, how could it be that the Lord would speak to Moses and Moses could hear him and listen? How did it, that happen? What was the mechanism, if you like? Well, we have it in that 10th verse, which we also heard. There's never yet risen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, face to face. That is, they were able to as it were, see one another, though not literally, of course, but communicate face to face. And if you read through Deuteronomy, you'll find many instances in which that, that happened to Moses. And as a result, he was the prophet as described there, able not only to hear the word of God, but also to speak and share it. So the Lord knew him face to face, and they must have had many conversations. And that, in effect, is the character of Moses' prayer life. Now, Jesus' prayer life has the same character. He often withdrew to pray, and we hear about it. And one of his prayers, we hear part of it, which is the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, which took place on the night before he was arrested, taken, condemned, and crucified. And we hear him say, in his, as he's praying, Abba, Father, all things are possible to you. Take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours. Praying with the heart, praying face to face with God. In his final conversation with the disciples, Jesus told them how they would be able to converse with God in just the same way as he did. And I'll read a few of the verses that tell us about this. First of all, in chapter 14 of John's Gospel, verses uh, 14 to 16. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another to be your advocate, who will be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. And then later on in the, in the same chapter, he says, I've told you these things whilst I'm with you. But the Advocate, 
the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have told you. Then turning over to chapter 15, he also says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. So those speak of Jesus sending someone to be an advocate or with the word used for it is strengthener or companion or encourager to be with them. And indeed that promise was fulfilled. It was fulfilled when the day of Pentecost came and the disciples and were all together in one place praying, significantly praying, face to face with God as it were. And suddenly this gift of the Spirit was given and demonstrated in a dramatic way with wind and the sound of and the sight of, as it were, tongues of flame on their heads. And out they went into the marketplace and spoke the good news the good things that God had for them. And uh, Peter recognized as he spoke to them and the people responded in amazement at what was happening. This was something a prophet had said already, the prophet Joel, who had said that uh, when the days, a day would come when God was pour out his flesh on all his children and they would know him and speak of him. Now my friends, prophecy has not ended. It has not ended. It's, all, it's not always been console, concerned with forecasting the future, but always about hearing, listening, attending, and then delivering God's words of the time. That's what pro prophecy is. That spirit who has given at, at Pentecost has never been withdrawn, never. He still gives the gift of prophecy to those who he chooses to do this work now. And he gives the same gift, the Spirit, to all of us, every single one of us who are his disciples. And we're given the Spirit so that we can hear his word and be guided and strengthened by it and able to live and walk in his ways. But not only that, as we heard in that little song we sang earlier on, uh, joy, 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 there are gifts that are given to each of us. We may not be prophets, but we all have the Spirit and the gifts that are, that are given to us. As Paul said, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, meekness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, those lovely things that grow naturally out of us. This is the work of the Spirit in our hearts, which we got, as the song said, deep in our hearts. But going back to prophets, what is uh, God saying in these days when life is so changed by what some have called the great disruption in which we all live, the world ground? Who are the prophets from this day of disruption? Well, some of them are Methodists. Wonderful. I don't know if you, how many of you managed to see all of us local preachers and ministers get given this uh, book regularly, four, three or four times a year called The Connection, and in the issue number 20, was it, which came out in the summer, uh, there are prophecies, words of prophecy, from two of our leaders, the president of the Methodist Conference, Richard Teal, and the vice president, who is uh, Caroline, Caroline Lawrence. And I'm going to read you now the words of the prof their prophecy. This is uh, Richard Teal, the president. Many people are saying the church will never be the same again, while others expect to slip back into the ways as they were be before, and we become normal again. As I write, he says, it's far too early to predict what will happen. But there's one thing for certain, that the new song which the Lord's people will sing will be the old song in new and exciting ways. He picks that phrase, the new song, out of the theme in this connection, which uh, relates to the time when the children of Israel were in Israel and were asked to sing a new song. And they said, how can we sing, how can we sing one of the songs of Zion in a strange land? And uh, Richard and everybody else who contributes to this edition of Contact Connection are seeing how we're in a strange land and how can we sing the Lord's song. 
So he says, uh, the Lord's people will be able to sing in a new and exciting ways. And then he goes back and speaks of how this first happened in the beginning of the Methodist movement. Methodism arose, he says, as a missionary movement. Wesley's focus was upon the spirit of God burning like fire in the hearts of converted in individuals, renewing the church, firing communities and spreading until scriptural holiness covers the whole earth. His vision was of one of restoration and renewal of all things through grace. And perhaps the president there is saying, we may be going to see something like that. And the, the vice president, Caroline, she, she uh, follows it up in her uh, word to us all in this, uh, this book, booklet. The verses that God has particularly laid on my heart, she says, are from Isaiah chapter 43 verses 18 and 19, actually, words which I wrote, read myself a few days beforehand and they struck me in the same way. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do, says God, a new thing. Now it springs forth, do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the deserts. They remind us, says Caroline, that God wants us to do new things among us and bring life and growth even in people and places that seem dry or tired. Well, what, is, what God has for us, we do not know yet. He could bless us richly with full renewal and revival as in the 18th century and as we were reminded of by, by the just there by the president. But whatever it may be that comes in our time, two things are true. First, it will begin with us who are his people, in whom his spirit lives, and it will spread out from there to the wider world. And its character will be as John Wesley described it. He spoke of it what had happened in his own experience in that great revival in the 18th century of which he was such a, an important minister. In a sermon on the, on the verse, What hath God wrought, which you find in the scripture. Uh, this was in 1777, actually preached on the day in which the foundation stone of Wesley's chapel in the city of Hope was, was laid. And these are some of the things he said, looking back at what he had experienced of the birth of Methodism. Methodism is the religion of the Bible, the religion of the primitive church. This old religion is no other than love. The love of God and of all mankind. The loving God with all our heart and soul and strength as having first loved us, you hear the echo there of the Matthew uh, uh, passage that we heard earlier. And the loving soul which God hath made every man on earth as our own soul. This love, this love is the great medicine of life, the never failing remedy for all the evils of a disordered world and for all the miseries and the vices of men. That echoes down the centuries to now, in my feeling. And to it, may add, we may add, as well as love God with all your heart and with all your soul and love your neighbour as yourself, we could add Jesus' new commandment that he gave to them, the disciples, that you loved one another as I have loved you. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. So, a final word to us all. Being disciples of Jesus Christ, in our face-to-face -face conversations with God, that is in your times of prayer and of contemplation and of thoughts striking you as things happen, having within you the spirit, the strengthener, the encourager that Jesus promised and who has never been withdrawn, 
Hear what he says to you. Attend to it. Respond and act upon it. And listen to the prophets who are speaking to us today as we pass through and eventually emerge from this great disruption. And I end with a short prayer, which is a, a prayer at the top of day, day nine in this year's Methodist Handbook, Methodist Prayer Handbook. Eternal God, as you have taught us to keep all your commandments by loving you and our neighbor, grant us the gift of your spirit that we may be devoted to you in all our hearts and united to each other with a pure will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Bob, for sharing those reflections on those readings and what it means to be a prophetic voice in the world today. I'm going to think as well about who might hear God's voice today. Who are the prophetic voices for our time? And what are they saying to us? What are they asking us to think about? And how are we to respond? Throughout the centuries, it's been not always those who follow God who have been prophetic voices. So who is it that speaks out? They don't have to be Christians. They don't have to be people of faith, but they need to be heard. And those of us who are Christian can add our voice to their cries and bring our faith into those conversations. So people that come immediately to mind for me, especially when I think about climate change, is David Attenborough and Greta Thunberg. Now, David Attenborough obviously has been around for a long time. He knows what he's talking about. And he has really emphasised with the films that have been shown about the state of our world and what we are doing to it. And then this young girl gets up and talks to people and she is the one who becomes heard, Greta Thunberg. People began to take her seriously. I'm sure there are others that we can add to the list, but it just goes to show that age is no barrier to being a prophetic voice or to being used by God to bring light into difficult situations. Another voice that comes to mind right now is Marcus Rashford as he uses not only his influence, but also his own life experience to talk about child poverty, challenging the government to rethink its policies on how to ensure that those who are struggling and the numbers are rising and will continue to rise whilst people are being made unemployment um, and places are, factories and things are beginning to close. That struggle is gonna go on and the means of support is not always there. So it's all very well talking about the, the different credits that are available, but actually they take time to access and they take time sometimes, and a lot of working out onto how to make those credit things work. So in the meantime, children um, are suffering and children in the 21st century should not be going without food any more than food banks should be for emergency, uh, should be used as a weekly thing. They should be for an emergency only for when somebody comes up against some stuff that happens in their life. It's not an ongoing solution. So these are people who are beginning to talk into the marketplace to ask us to rethink what we're expect, our expectations are. What is it that God says to us? God says to love your neighbor. And that is all of the people, not just the few, not the ones who look like us or sound like us, but all people. So I want to bring you the voices of another set of young people. This time it's the voices of the young people of the Methodist Church, who when they met last year produced a manifesto for the church to take on board for 2020. So I think Dan is hopefully going to be able to show you the poster that came out um, that was produced as a result. And just in case it's not uh, clear enough for you to read, this is what the poster says. The children and young people at Three Generate 2019 have spoken out. This is what we care about. Let's take action together to make sure God is in our conversations and our decisions. To be kind, helpful and respectful. 
to build an inclusive and welcoming church, to change the stereotype of churches being boring and modernize them, make churches more eco-friendly and be better resourced to support mental health, particularly issues that young people face. And the last one on there is challenge people in power about climate change, poverty and world peace. Now, all of those are good things. There's nothing there that actually isn't something that should be on our agenda as churches. But as we read that manifesto, the words are prophetic and appropriate, not just for when it was written out last November, but for the situation we find ourselves in. So we're going to start with church and changing the stereotype of church as being boring. This is the words from the young people in particular have variation in worship styles. Sadly, the next bit is go and eat food together after church in places young people like to help support communities. There is something that we'd love to be able to do, but right now is much more difficult to do. Make church accessible and welcoming to all ages building relationships between those who use the church buildings. Again, something that, you know, the churches across Brighton and Hove are thinking about. Modernised churches in particular have Wi-Fi in every church. I think more than now we have realised the importance of being able to link to people through modern technology. The other one that follows that is to have more comfy seating. And as I look around, here we are, a church, uh, we have people who are sat on their beds, people who are sat on their sofas. Um, you're all in much more comfortable seating than maybe the hard pews of our local churches might provide. But here they are. This is what they were saying in November. Um, and they're also asking us to work in schools to help children and young people to be open to God. That's one set of suggestions. The other one is on the environment. Actively tackle climate change. And what can the churches do? Stop deforestation in plant and on church land and more Methodist eco churches. Here are young people who are talking in to our situation and they want us to make changes and we don't make them quick enough for many of our young people. In terms of equality, they want to create a church that supports, encourages and campaigns for equality, diversity and inclusion. That's regardless of any of the boundaries. So that's age, LGBTQ+, gender, disability, race, and create a church that is better resourced on mental health issues. And in particular, understanding the stresses that young people and families face. And to, in terms of poverty, to work to end poverty and the world hunger, in particular, challenge the universal credit and benefit system and support fair change, uh, sorry, fair trade and support those who are in poverty, homeless, refugees, asylum seekers, by calling for better job opportunities and housing. These are the prophetic words of our young people. And we, all of us, need to think how we also join their voices as grown-ups in this situation. How do we listen to what they have to say? How do we learn from the things that they want? Because they are the prophetic voice for us today. So I think all of us uh, need to think about how we raise awareness of issues that dehumanise people, but also challenge us to think about the things that matter. To me, the prophetic voice should be like the grit in an oyster shell, allowing it to do its thing and would produce a pearl of great price. When we listen to the prophetic voices of all our people, young, old and those in between, listen to the voices of those who have no faith and to those who have faith, when their words begin to resonate with what we believe God in Christ is saying to us, then maybe we can produce that pearl of great price, which is about love and equality and a sense of everybody knowing who they are before God. Jesus said to his early listeners, and he says to us, you shall love the Lord your, the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. And on these two commandments, thank all the law and the prophets. As one of the 
a Jewish rabbi said everything else is just an explanation. So I want us to think about that and what we can do and how we together can make a difference. For all of us, we have the opportunity to hear God's voice. And it may be a, a voice that challenges us in our sense of calling, which is what we heard last week from Sue, as she was testing out her calling into uh, ordained ministry. It might be testing out our calling as we hear God's voice to speak to us, to be something particular within the life of the church. Or maybe it's testing out what God is saying to us as God pushes the buttons in the name of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit for us to hear what is needed for this day and age. Where should we be speaking up and speaking out? So we're going to listen together um, the song have and sing together where you can. I'll put the words in the chat line because I have a feeling they're not on the, um, the slides that I was able to find. So it's have you heard God's voice? And then after that, Dan will lead us in our prayers and intercession. So I, I'm going to uh, pray, uh, uh, pray through our intercessions this morning. I've, I've been taking notes um, and just writing down words of different people have been speaking and so on. And I'm going to try and draw them together in um, into a set of prayers uh, now for us. Um, I'll then leave um, three minutes and 34 seconds of um, of space to uh, for anyone else to pray, because I'm going to play a piece of music, which happens to be that long. Um, so that's how long you've got. <laughs> and you can write your um, write your prayers in the chat box or just take that time. It's quite a meditative piece of music. It's a uh, by a band called The Album Leaf. I might have used this band before. Um, I'm not sure if I've used this song before. Um, it's, it's a perfect album for a rainy day, I would say. Uh, I listened to it way more than that. Uh, and given it was raining not so long ago, maybe it's a good, good choice for this morning. Um, and so that will be a, a piece of meditative music to, uh, to pray and put your things in the chat box. Um, but I'll pray for us first, and then I will, we'll draw the prayers at the end together with the, with the Lord's Prayer. But I'll, I'll kick us off and uh, pray for us this morning. So let us pray. Our God, we come before you this morning with the words we seek to love our neighbour on our lips, in our minds, in our hearts. Our God, but we know so well that perhaps this is a relaxed way of doing things. We often shy away from the uh, words that we will walk the path that will cost us much as we seek to love our neighbour. Perhaps we seek to do it in ways that are easy rather than the ways that are difficult that bring about change. But we thank you, God, that you love us, that you care about us, that you work with us, that you encourage us out of our ways of being that perhaps aren't the best ways of being. And that in that we may have the hope that with you we can change the world, that we can change people's lives. Our God, you are the God who spoke and all the atoms in the universe heard, listened and they acted and formed the very dust that our bodies are made of, as well as all the things that are around us. Our God, that very word, which had so much power, became flesh. It walked among us as Jesus taught us, and it showed us how we may love our neighbour. And you leave your spirit with us, speaking to us still guiding us, supporting us, loving us. And so, God, we seek you this morning, this week. Speak to us again. Help us to hear. And in hearing, help us to listen. And in listening, help us to act in a way that will change the world around us, those people's lives around us. And there are many things that we may pray for, many people. We've heard key workers mentioned, 
in this time of crisis, our God, we are suddenly so aware and so thankful for those people who take care of us, who love us, who make sure we're well, make sure our society works all the ways in which they do. We're sorry when we don't notice these, when, when there isn't a crisis, but we are so thankful for them now and we pray for them that they may do, do their jobs uh, well and be supported in the ways that they need to be supported in doing their jobs. We think of those who suffer most at this time, those who were suffering before but have become even more acute now. We think of the food banks which have become a, a very regular thing in our society, a thing which we just take as being there but we are reminded this morning that they are meant to be for emergencies not just for the norm. We pray for those who use food banks on a regular basis. We pray that they may be given the support, that they may not continue to use these as a way of life, that they are just for emergencies. So again, we thank you for those who do run such things, but those who support such things that are sadly needed at the moment. So we pray for ourselves, Lord. We pray for our church. We pray that we may be your hands, your feet as we react and try and work out the problems that are around us. Give us courage, our God, to walk that path that will cost us much, to do the things that are difficult. And so I leave now as there's plenty more to be prayed for, of, of course. Um, I leave a few moments now uh, where we listen to this piece of music um, and we can pray for the things that are on our hearts uh, right this right now and all those things that are in the news uh, that we're thinking about. Just before we do pray the Lord's Prayer, there's one word or two words actually that I missed as I was looking through my notes. They're very scrawled. And that is the words, uh, the word prophet and the word youth. So I want to pray for the prophets in um, our world and those who are those young people who are prophets to the church. So, God, we thank you for those people who follow the great tradition of being the ones who speak for you who encourage us to move, to act, to do things. We thank you for our youth. We think of Three Generate, for all that energy and desire to see good done in this world, in our churches, to see your love brought around, about in our communities. We pray that our youth and all those who are prophets in all kinds of different ways know your encouragement in this very moment, this very week, that they continue to speak out, to challenge, to question the ways we've always done things, that perhaps things could change and be different and maybe better. So we thank you for those with the courage to speak and may they continue to do so. And so we draw all these prayers together as we pray uh, the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. We're going to come now to um, the close of our service. Just a reminder before we do that, that there's this evening's prayer and meditation, which is being led by Jonathan. And then next Sunday, it will be his accreditation service. So, so join us all next Sunday and be part of that. And remind other people, that that's what's happening those that maybe you've got people at church who could join but haven't bothered yet give them a chance to uh, to join us as well as we um we celebrate john's and uh, jonathan's ending of his exams and and now being on full plan as a local preacher so i'm not going to bless you in in the normal sense what we're going to do is we're going to listen to a guatemalian um blessing it's i think this is a really beautiful blessing it's in singing the faith it's number seven seven four 
I will stick um, the words into the chat line again because it's just as music, but it really is a beautiful blessing. And this blessing is for all of us and for all of those that we love and know. And then at the close of the blessing, that's when you can unmute yourself and you can have that cacophony of sound that is everybody saying goodbye to everybody. So we'll do that at the very end, at the end of this, this song. But meanwhile, as you, as you hear the words and sing the words, remember that we are blessing one another with the deep peace um, of the earth be with you. <laughs>